Before I introduce tonight's speaker, Teardad Zogadar, I will share a quick overview of the New Midland Group Development Programme. New Midland Group is a consortium of free artist-led organisations located in Nottingham. These are Backlit, One Forsby Street and Primary. This is the second public event in the New Midland Group Development Programme, following on from last month's talk, Art in Cities, A Short History and Some Current Predicaments, with Suhail Malik, which is now available on the New Midland Group website. Over the next 12 months, New Midland Group will deliver a programme intended to support established artists, individuals with an interest in contemporary art, and anyone anywhere in between. Through the development programme, we hope to provide routes into contemporary art with an emphasis on Midlands-based creatives um, from, from arts, Midlands-based creatives who have not engaged in formal arts education or from backgrounds currently underrepresented within the sector. We'll focus on providing routes into contemporary art and better understanding and articulating the value of artist development. The programme will centre around a group of core associates, some of whom are here this evening, and will include an expansive programme of free discussions, workshops and events, such as this evening's talk, plus bursary opportunities open to practitioners based in the Midlands. Open calls for collaborative production and research and development bursaries are now live on our website, with the deadline for each being the 5th of July. The New Midland Group Development Programme is funded by Arts Council England and supported by a growing number of partners from across the region and beyond. Tonight, Teardad Zogadar will speak about contemporary arts complicity with gentrification schemes and the role it has to play in land grabs and urban development, foregrounding alternative ways of working in an urban context and proactive methods of utilising the traction of contemporary art. Teardad will discuss curated projects, including Satista and Realty. Teardad Zogadar is an international curator and writer. Since 2017, he's been artistic director at the Summer Academy Paul Klee. Um, curatorial work includes Biennale settings as well as long-term research-driven efforts. Most recently, an, uh, an associate curator at KW Institute for Contemporary Art Berlin from 2016 to 2020. Writing includes traction and applied and polemic attempts to locate contemporary art. Ongoing work on a third novel, which is Headbanger, is made possible through the generous support from the Foundation of Arts Initiatives. I will now hand over to Teardad. Thank you. Thank you for the intro and for the invitation. It's, it's great to be here. Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, I will, before I do anything else, I'll already do the share screen technicalities to get them over with because they terrify me. Uh, there we go. Um, is this, this, this works? It's, yeah, it's it good. okay. Fantastic. Um, so I'll be, I'll be drawing on the Realty project, which is a, a long-term uh, investment in trying to find uh, an, an answer, a productive response to this situation of complicity between contemporary art and uh, processes of gentrification. And right now I'm in the middle of trying to uh, compile a book. So the content will be a little scrunched and dense and I, you know, I'll rely on the Q&A to break it up a little bit. Um, I'll be referring to the Q&A quite a bit during the course of this talk um, because I don't know my audience and I don't want to risk baffling half of it and boring the other half. Um, so I'll, I'll be touching on a number of things that I'll just offer as, you know, uh, talking points for, for later. Um, and one other uh, uh, pointer is, is that it, it's quite, I'm, I'm in Berlin right now, a lot of the research over recent years, even though it started in, uh, in the West Bank in Palestine, a lot of the recent uh, research has been in Berlin, so it's quite Berlin centric. Um, but I think you'll agree that in many ways it is a very hopeful, uh, helpful and hopeful uh, point of comparison. Um, there are other examples too. Um, so the, let me uh, it's just engage in a little clarification of terms before I get to the, the nuts and bolts. Um, when it comes to art and gentrification, um, we do already have an intuitive grasp of this thing. Um, someone once said, 
oh, I can tap dance that argument on your forehead, um, which is one way to put it. Um, it's, there still are quite comical misunderstandings that uh, occur. And so I'll just, I'll just map out two, two three points before, before getting into the actual um, main, uh, main part of the talk. One is that um, gentrification is a, is a two to three step process. It's not just a case of uh, urban renewal. Um, it's a case of um, a rent gap being identified. A rent gap is the difference between the present value of a given location and the potential value in the future. It's a process of influx of attention, um, of uh, uh, capital um, and of new populations which displace the populations which were there before. Only if these things happen, um, does it make any sense to talk about gentrification? It's not, it's not just a case of lifestyle or quality of life. And I'm highlighting this because the term is used a lot um, in that uh, rather cutesy way within the art field. And at the risk of being pedantic, I just want to insist on that. Secondly, um, the locations we're talking about, and Suhail already touched upon this uh, 10, when was this, uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, they're not ubiquitous. Actually, the most, most um, neighborhoods stay rich or poor at quite um, regular, surprisingly consist consistent rates. Um, it's a minority of locations which go through the transitions we're going to talk about um, today. And they happen to be the locations where contemporary art tends to rear its, its pretty head. Um, but I, I want to underline that this is not a, a universal thing by any means. Thirdly and lastly, I do not want to culturalize the argument. I do not want to overstate the role of, of contemporary art. Um, the, the, the onus still to this day is on the state. The state is the most hard hitting actor on this playing field. Um, and it, it, nothing happens without the state, without policymakers. Um, and before uh, getting into a slightly more uh, hopeful uh, part of the, of, the, of the talk, and I want you to walk away. If anything, I'd like you to walk away with a sense of possibility when it comes to contemporary art. Um, and the challenges of an urban setting today. But first, I, uh, I'd like to plot out, um, to moan and groan a little bit and to, to highlight how the state is actually uh, um, complicit and also how contemporary art has its own role in this uh, state of affairs. And then I'll go on to the more sort of um, uh, less melancholic part of the conversation. Um, so yeah, without going into these points, um, we can do that later. Um, the, the policymakers are complicit either by putting places on the map in a particular way, by uh, proactively um, interpolating uh, the model citizen for uh, model neighborhoods, uh, by assisting uh, private home, owner, home ownership, um, by assisting a more aggress aggressive large scale uh, forms of investment or by way of redevelopment in its own right. So when the state becomes uh, a, gentr a gentrifier in its, own, in its own right. And I'm skimming over these vast um, points, talking points, which again, we can come back to um, later. Um, and I'll, do, I'll be similarly flippant when it comes to contemporary art and its role in these patterns but it's important to at least uh, stake it out. Um, I'll go a little bit more into detail here. Um, so similarly to, to, uh, to policymakers, contemporary art can have a very, uh, play a very proactive role by way of placemaking, putting uh, locations on a map. This can happen by way, if you look at the Wiki, Wikipedia page on gentrification, it actually highlights the role of artists um, uh, I think they say something like a critical sense of their surroundings, which helps them uh, uh, trace opportunities. Some formulation by way of, you know, those words, and we, we know what they mean. We all have friends, colleagues, acquaintances who, who are these, you know, uh, uh, this intuitive sense of um, 
you know, uh, truffle pigs of, of spatial capital, uh, if you will, who, who know how to sense when a, a certain location has promise. Um, and either they invest in it um, financially or more, more often by way of sweat equity, uh, by investing blood, sweat, and tears in a space that they invest in temporarily before being uh, kicked out by the actual owners. This is, this is the sort of story that is most uh, commonly told. Um, on a more ideological level, as a cultural authority, if you will, contemporary art does two other things. It engages in what some people call art washing. Um, if you look at the many growth-oriented models of art-assisted development, you see how um, the forces behind our built environment are cutesified, humanized, or hidden altogether. KW itself, with which I, uh, a venue with which I collaborate, still uh, does this a lot, um, willingly or unwillingly. Um, it's this exercise of casting the city as a level playing field of, of, of possibility. Um, and again, we can, we can come back to this later, but I think you, have a, you get a sense of what I'm uh, talking about. The, the third uh, instance is, it's less about making these processes harmless so much as making them feel natural, uh, normal. Um, it, some, some would call this capitalist realism. It's the exercise of turning what is contingent and historical into something um, natural, um, maybe melancholic, maybe fun, but uh, part of what a city is supposed to be. And you can see this in socially engaged interventions, which are less about demands and more about a certain kind of melancholia. You can see it in our language of flux, which celebrates creative disruption on all levels. You can see it in our role as tools of soft power on a diplomatic stage, et cetera, et cetera. Um, some of you might want examples for these various um, uh, uh, instances, premises, and I'll gladly do that in the end. It's too distracting to do this in the beginning. Um, the fourth and last um, way in which uh, contemporary art becomes complicit is by way of what uh, the writer Nicolas Marc uh, calls zombification. And by this, he means that when, um, when a neighborhood has reached the end of the process of gentrification, certain values, certain things that we appreciate about the city um, have been obliterated, but they can be resuscitated in a simulacral form. They can be resuscitated as zombies. So multiculturalism comes back as a restaurant. Uh, inter immigration can exist in the form of a, a festival economy. Um, urbanity can persist as a biennial um, and so on and so forth. Um, and, and KW itself plays a very key role in this, um, within this, the situation of, of Berlin Mitte. Um, and I think these are things that we are more or less familiar with. Um, and I can zoom in on them later very happily. They've, uh, they, they're increasingly becoming part of uh, you know, the way we, we talk about art in, in the city, and it's almost hard to imagine that there are uh, possibilities uh, beyond it. But of course, um, there are. Um, I'll quickly mention the way in which state policy has, has shifted in a number of cities across Europe. Berlin is a good example. Um, and and Andre Holm, who's a, a prominent uh, former policymaker, sociologist, activist here in the city. He, he's, he, summarized, he summarized the possibilities along these four options, the reining in of private interests, public land ownership, um, uh, subsidies for affordable housing to create so, uh, affordable housing and support for various forms of, of collective ownership. Uh, someone else summarized it uh, along the lines of uh, democratization, decommodification and affordability, uh, which is another way of, of lumping together the, the various legislative measures that a state can pursue. But of course, it's not just about laws, it's about a multi-layered effort to create 
um, a stage where certain socioeconomic uh, demands can resonate. And this is a very long-term um, process, but it is moving in this direction in a number of, of places across Europe. And I think that uh, artists and curators are somewhere else now, and that this process began before COVID. Um, for now, there seems to be reason to be optimistic and to, 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 to argue that if anything, COVID has accelerated uh, these tendencies and maybe it will leave uh, a lasting mark. Um, time will tell. Um, I'm gonna go through these uh, six uh, premises, working premises, spend more time with some rather than others. Um, I'll go into one case study that I was involved in to particularly talk about redistribu re redistribution and propaganda. Um, and may maybe just allow me to, to say that just as I was mentioning with regards to policy uh, being more than just laws, um, this stuff too is demands geological timescales. It's a matter of moving a lake with a, with a teaspoon, but there will be a little choice if we, in my opinion, if we, if we want to find a way to uh, avoid becoming a gated professional community in our own right. Um, so to begin with um, regulation, what I, what I mean by that is, is um, in some ways, and it's counterintuitive to begin with this, it's a question of, of shades of no. It's a question of what um, not to do as an artist or, or curator. Um, even if you choose not to be specialized in you know, collectivized practices, invested in political economy, et cetera, even if you prefer to do corporate plop art instead, there are still options. There are many places to pursue your work where the rent gap is not operative, where you're not necessarily toxic. If you're in contemporary art to begin with, chances are that you enjoy the mobility of the middle classes and you can reinvent, reinvest your gallery experience, your talent, your diplomas elsewhere. For now, uh, the spirit of uh, you know, access undeniable or of don't stop, don't stop, um, this libertarian cowboy sense of, of um, you know, breaking down one boundary after, an after another, it has deep roots in the, in the art field, which go all the way back to the Renaissance and heroic artists who uh, left the guilds and scoffed at medieval regulations and so on. Um, but raging egos don't need to be a stumbling block. Um, I discovered a book recently by the anthropologist Gabriella Coleman about uh, hackers in the US, um, a book called Coding Freedom, and which describes where even these um, hackers with a ferocious sense of, of individual liberty could agree on a code of conduct that formalizes internal values and recruitment criteria. Um, and even within um, the field, um, art world examples uh, do exist. And of course, you will notice that I'm no longer talking just about the extraction uh, from a site. I'm talking about our tendency to juice ourselves and each other because we think we have no other options. And art world examples do exist uh, if we look at pressure groups such as WAGE in New York, BBK in Berlin, uh, professional networks like the new commissioners, artist unions across Scandinavia, cultural boycotts, um, or the bullish picket lines of the Boyle Heights Alliance Against Art and Displacement, um, all of which is necessary if artists want other options um, beyond the extractivism that we have come to know as business as usual. Um, I'll be getting a little more concrete now. I know, I'm, I know I've been quite abstract. Um, with, with the second working premise of, of redistribution. Um, so there are, there are cases of redistribution within art, 
where it's a case of artists claiming their share of the surplus. Um, but then there are also cases of uh, the capital of art being redistributed to constituencies beyond our field. One example of the former, my favorite from a UK context is um, the efforts of the duo Vermeer and Heiremans, which attempted to boost the value of the Pump House Gallery location in London and redistribute the surplus to a wider community of artists. And they have a terrific publication called Mod A Modest Proposal, which documents these, these efforts and introduces the catchy term prop proprietary estoppel, very catchy, um, which is a legal device used in cases of disputed inheritance when labor was invested in a property and enhanced its value, but remained unrecognized as such. And obviously this is a godsend for artists who invest a sweat equity in a given location before being given the boot. But the jackpot is um, when um, redistribution happens with regards to constituency with, beyond our field. And to talk about this, I'd like to go into a case study I've spoken in public about before, but it really does lend, in, lend itself to a lecture. It's a great story and it even has a happy ending, which is obviously very welcome these days. Um, so I'll, I'll uh, bear with me as I go into this, even if you've heard the story before. It's the story of the House, uh, House der Statistik, House of Statistics here in Berlin, um, which is the house not to the left of the image, it says Reisebüro, but to the, to the right. Uh, the, the, the rectangular thing with what looks like a paper airplane um, signage on the top. It's uh, uh, this, this house of statistics with a, was a 40,000 square meter modernist Moloch right in the middle of Berlin. It feels as large as a neighborhood and it's very much haunted by its role in uh, you know, communist East Germany data management. Um, it's quite, you know, uh, seductive in its, in its modernist uh, spleen to this day, even if it was abandoned around 1989, uh, was more or less empty ever since and was slated for demolition as, a, as part of a very aggressive plan in Berlin called the Kohlhoff plan to Manhattanize the Berlin skyline. So it was, it was gonna make way for for a high rise on, this is Alexanderplatz for those, those of you who know the city. Um, and a few very odd um, snapshots of what it looked like um, from, from within. Now, um, 2015, after uh, you know, uh, uh, decades of, of just sort of sitting there waiting for its demolition, um, a coalition of artists uh, called the ABBA Collective pulled off a street party as art intervention, which included a large banner with the municipal logo on the facade, announcing a new public facility for all types of social cultural purposes. Um, the happening was completely symbolic. The demolition was long, um, you know, agreed on. But within a few years, the, the, the event went from a hashtag to a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, today, uh, the, the Haus der Statistik is a, is a pioneering development which is steered by a very large coalition of actors. Um, the sale and demolition are canceled um, and a 65,000 square meter extension is being now built as we speak with space for culture, social work, affordable housing, education, as well as a new city hall and municipal offices. And it's a, it's a fairy tale ending that sets the stage for a very large scale experiment of artists rubbing shoulders with social workers and technocrats, etc. Um, and it's, it's also a very nice monumental contrast to the myth of Berlin as this space of endless, you know, uh, short-lived, breathless pop-up opportunities. 
Um, now, in um, recording for um, Berlin Art Week 2019, the setting became an op an opportunity for this exercise in in redistribution. I mean, what I've been describing is already a, a very unconventional exercise in redistribution. Um, there was an opportunity for uh, uh, a contribution on my part, on KW's part, via the Berlin Art Week in 2019, um, when the Berlin Senate set aside half a million, half a million euro uh, for art in public spaces. And the, the pot of money was, was, um, was granted to KW and the Center for Art and Urbanistics as a duo. And the Center for Art and Urbanistics was part of the coalition that I was talking about a minute ago, which secured the survival of the Haus der Statistik. Um, and together we, we decided to make the Haus der Statistik the context and the cause um, of a collaboration that we called Statista. Um, here's a bit of animated relief from my endless talking at you. Um, there's even, if I knew how to work the volume, but I won't push my luck, there's, a, there's kind of like an ice cream van jingle that goes with it. Maybe it would help further relax my audience. Um, no such luck. Um, so the, the KW with its sheer status within Berlin, financially KW is a dwarf. But in terms of social and cultural capital, it really has the ear of Berlin policymakers, which is why we got the gig. But then we also relied on the sheer expertise of artists such as the Center for um, Art and Urbanistics, um, city political expertise and their ties to activists, planners, bureaucrats, policymakers, et cetera, which we relied on to pull off what we wanted to, to um, pull off and we did, we did a lot. We really milked the, 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 the budget uh, that was at our disposal. Um, it, was, um, it was a case of art as, you know, a propagandistic intervention, um, as neighborhood outreach, um, as a, um, uh, a tool for speculative proposals uh, for the Haus der Statistik itself. Um, and I, I think that um, we were, I can, I can gladly go into more detail um, uh, in the q and I'll, I'll, in a minute, I'll go into, into one single uh, project to give you a more hands-on idea of the whole thing. Um, but I'll, I'll quickly claim before that I think that for all its, the bumps in the road and the limitations of the project, we were successful enough on, on four different levels. Um, first of all, the, the mainstream press was um, very much on board and was very happy to see art unfolding in a weird and wonderful setting such as this. And we offered them an easy target um, they ridiculed us as, as hipsters, and we gave them, you know, colorful storylines and so forth. Uh, the city senate was happy to have a creative spotlight on a state-sponsored development project. The contemporary art field was pleased with the conceptual framing and with visual markers, which we chose to highlight at the important moment of the vernissage such as, for example, the spotlights aimed at telegenic piles of rubble, uh, which, which dot the Hosta Statistic um, courtyard and which, which touched a nerve. Um, finally, the Hosta Statistic itself stands to gain from our on-site investments, such as lighting, repairs, security, political attention, media buzz, and those proposals uh, by way of architecture outreach and, and also FinTech. And I'd like to give you an example of that um, right now, something a little more um, precise. And that is the Statista project called uh, Bcoin. 
Um, so it's like one of these, what do they, what do they call them? Matryoshka dolls. There's the Hoster statistic, there's Statista within it. And within Statista is this example here, uh, Bcoin, which we pulled off uh, in collaboration with collectives such as Moabis, Nascent, and Hivize and Exa. And the aim was to develop a cryptocurrency for the Halster statistic, um, a currency that would demonstrate that the, you know, a place like the Halster statistic is a is a site of the production of value, and a currency that could redistribute this value as equitably as possible, because even within grassroots settings such as this, there are endless amounts of labor which are invested, which are not recognized as such. You may have noticed that this is something, it's a leitmotif that keeps coming up in this talk. Um, and through a cryptocurrency, you can remunerate efforts such as, such as that. Um, the, the idea of Bitcoin was to make the Hostage Statistic a kind of flagship store for a joint stock company that redistributes our, our currency Bitcoin according to in-house criteria. Now, these criteria really did have something to do with bees. We had, we had beehives. Um, and initially we thought to use the productivity of our bees um, as uh, the basis for an alternative value chain with you know, their honey as an alternative gold standard, pardon the pun. Uh, but then we opted for a less extractive uh, modus operandi and, and went for the well-being of our bees as, um, uh, as a basis instead. So we started measuring the weight, the movement, the temperature, um, and we told our audience that if they wanted to partake in our joint stock company, um, they could either acquire our beekeeping kit and monitor the well-being of their own bees, or, um, and produce their own bee coins, or invest uh, by way of conventional, you know, euros. Um, the Hoster statistic was a perfect venue for this, not only because it was visible, also because there were thousands of window frames, uh, leftover frames that we used for our hives. Um, and also because some of you may know that downtown locations are actually now more attractive to bees than countrysides because of rampant monocultures uh, that define our countryside. So if you have a certain amount of parks and Berlin is one of the greenest cities around, uh, they're actually better off there, um, which is kind of sad, but true. Um, now, when it comes to the redistribution of resources via art, fintech financial technology experiments such as this um, are becoming more and more prevalent and the great thing about them is that they're they're very transparent uh, you don't have to smuggle money the way you know we often do when we can you know even within statista we sort of channeled it uh, through this benign form of embezzlement that we know from the art world there's none of that through fintech and there's no need for Robin Hood heroics either. Um, and there are a, a huge number of artists who are pursuing these kinds of premises. Luisa Crosman in Brazil, uh, the Alliance of the Southern Triangle in Miami, Macau in Bala Milan, further field in London. Um, there are many out there. Um, and so I'll, I'll, I'll end the, the House of Statistics uh, slash Statista discussion there. I hope I gave you a sense of what I, what I meant by, by redistribution, um, but also um, by way of um, propaganda. And with um, propaganda, um, a, I mean, I know it's, it's, some, it's, it's a bit of a provocative term, um, an artist friend of mine once said, I'm, I don't wear a hat and I'm not Joseph Boyce. Um, and what he meant by that is that I don't, I don't want to, you know, attract attention to myself in the name of, of any cause, however uh, grand. Um, and it's true that we're not so comfortable with that kind of stuff 
uh, nowadays, the, the kind of airtime that artists typically get, particularly when it comes to, uh, you know, art in the city and gentrification is one of a, a flickering of being a both, both a victim and a perpetrator. It's the typical flickering duck rabbit of the precarious middle classes at large. And I guess it's fine. Um, it gives us, a, it's kind of tragic comic and it gives us a lot of airtime, but I do wonder whether it would be possible to, um, to, to make a proactive propaganda, a posture of choice after all. Um, and by, by this, I don't mean necessarily the volume or the drama so much as the, the future oriented uh, gesture. The, the Latin root of uh, propa, uh, uh, propagare means to set forward, extend, spread, increase, multiply by layers, breed, offspring, and so forth. Um, it's not so much about the sound and the fury so much as the, the propositional moment. Um, and um, the, 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 the usual paraphernalia of contemporary art, uh, the, the creative disruption, the tricksterism, um, the indeterminacy that will always be there. The question whether it is whether art can go further to actually reorganize the algebra of what is visible and viable and true. Um, and I think that in the in the case of the of, of Statista and the House of Statistics, we we actually were possibly have been a, a helpful cog in a bigger policy making machine. Um, every public mandate also hinges on aesthetic efficacy, on image shaping efforts which pathologize or glamorize or what a German socialist uh, Jochen Vogel calls a representability of intention. Um, there's a very moving interview that you can see on uh, Realty uh, TV, which is an artist commission like Christopher Roth, where he talks about how his own ideas of progressive land policy failed because they lacked in this kind of representability of intention. Um, and, um, one last point on propaganda is that we must remember that contemporary art always already anticipates its own future anyway. Um, consciously or subconsciously, we approach our neighborhoods with possessive attitudes that transform them into imaginary sites. We mold their futures regardless. And to this day where less artists and curators are less strangely, less mistrusted, um, uh, or less vocally mistrusted than, than other actors. We're still given the benefit of the doubt as witnesses, representatives, consens consensus makers, and enablers. Um, let me move on to the question of ownership, particularly collective ownership. Um, Recently, this has become quite mainstream, no? Uh, like uh, you have a collective infrastructures. Uh, I think the coming documenta is gonna highlight a good number of very important examples. Uh, Ruan Grupa, the curators themselves are an example of collective um, infrastructure. Uh, Eflux is another uh, famous such example. Um, and again, what I would just reiterate is that this is great in terms of uh, the means for artists to claim a bigger share of the surplus. Um, but the, the, um, the jackpot is when you uh, manage to use this as a means to a broader redistributive end. And the highest possible aspirations actually to remove a property from the pressures of profit and placemaking altogether. Uh, Rochenko had this beautiful phrasing in 1925 the things in our hands must be equals, comrades. Um, I'll, I'll give you two quick examples, a, a somewhat complicated slash problematic one, and then a slightly more happy slash straightforward one. Uh, the complicated one is, is Maria Eichhorn's contribution to Documenta 2017. Some of you may know it. It's called Building an Unowned Property. Thanks to the cultural capital of Documenta and the financial capital of the Migro Museum in Zurich, um, 
Eichhorn bought a stately empty house uh, in downtown Athens um, and removed it from use and circulation, free, I, I quote, freeing it from ownership forever. Um, the curator in me is delighted because it does have a kind of Rodchenkian touch to it. But unfortunately, one, uh, you know, curator's delight is another man's uh, badly needed asset on, on the ground. Um, and especially in Athens, you can ask yourself what the contribution is here. Um, together with students, uh, we were once close to squatting the place um, and decided not to do it because we realized that, you know, the sense of entitlement that would have uh, prompted us to do so would have been premised on this fly in, fly out uh, uh, mode of, MO of, of contemporary art all over again. And we were very um, relieved to hear that locals were on the verge of squatting it anyway. I, I don't know whether they have, I was unable to, to find out in time for this talk. Um, a slightly more straightforward example in, in here in Berlin, where uh, Eichhorn is actually based, is Ex Roda Print. And again, I'm guessing that some of you will know this, this place. Um, it's, it's a complex in Wedding, which is a working class part of, of town, where uh, an artist duo also succeeded in removing uh, a property from use and circulation. Um, but by way of purchasing it together with small businesses from the immediate uh, neighborhood and introducing a non-resale clause in the contract. Um, and also introducing um, a division, uh, one third each, with the, 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 the complex being devoted to uh, art, uh, social facilities, and small neighborhood businesses in, in, equal, in equal measure. So this is a very, a very different way to, to approach the, the, the romance of Rodchenko's premise. Um, I'm realizing now that I'm actually going slower than, than I, I thought I would be. So I'm gonna skip the, the third and last example I had by way of, of, of property, collective property. And I'm gonna to jump to, to specialization. Um, earlier on, I, I, was, I was talking about moving a, a lake with a teaspoon. And what I was trying to hint at is that all of these examples demand a completely different investment in, in, in knowledge production to that of um, reinventing the wheel with every project, uh, doing uh, gentrification um, for the one show and then moving on to Fred Moten for the next and then uh, eco-feminism for a third uh, sort of phase of your, of your career. Um, it's, it's a waste of, of resources that you only learn to appreciate as such once you've invested I don't know, five, six, seven, ten uh, years of, of, of your time. And that is when you begin to, to realize um, quite how amnesiac and, and also arrogant our art world brand of, of self-imposed amateurism um, really is. I'd like to highlight that contemporary art um, takes a lot of pride in unknowing, but this is not always the case with all forms of art. Historically, look at Bauhaus, it's, it's very different, uh, or, or blockchain that I was talking about earlier. Um, these artists have, have no issues with, with hard knowledge. And even within the mainstream as we know it today, I would argue that when, whenever critique becomes proposal, whenever playing on representation becomes representation to court, um, whenever all that false modesty becomes a narrative claim, we're actually inching beyond the incapacitation of, of artists, uh, which we've become accustomed to today. Um, you notice that I'm 
I'm, I'm speeding up a little bit because I, I promised to, to not transcend the 15 minute mark. And I wanna, I wanna keep that promise for, for everyone's sake. Um, the last premise is, is that of um, channeling mobility. And this, this, goes, this goes back to a lot of what uh, Suhail Malik was saying a few weeks ago. The possibilities, the options open to contemporary art as part of a very particular post-industrial urban environment. Um, post-industrial locations are not tied to their service sectors the way industrial cities were tied to their factories. It's a different kind of relationship. It's one that's less beholden to blackmail. Uh, it's more of a tactical alignment along long-term shared interests. A, a factory can up and leave any time. Um, it's much harder for a museum. That said, a museum, if deprived of the necessary uh, tender loving care, can also wither into uh, irrelevance or, or caricature. Um, but, 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 you know, the cultural sector is not the only example here. Um, I would argue that more broadly, employment in a post-industrial town um, cannot be easily disentangled from its environment, its infrastructure, its specificity, its quality of life, however um, a mythical um, these, you know, or semi-empirical these, these factors may be. The, the Berlin uh, pressure group, artist pressure group, BBK, likes to conjure the danger of a Berlin brain drain. Uh, their slogan is, Geist ist flüchtiger als Kapital, haltet ihn fest, which means the intellect is more fleeting than capital, hold it tight. Um, and they mean this more, they don't mean it as a threat, they mean it as a shared concern. Now, in the spirit of this kind of, of this shared concern, um, a number of experiments here in Berlin, what they've tried to do is to channel tourism towards something more equitable or, or decelerated. Um, I'm happy to, to talk about uh, an example from Palestine that I worked with, Rewalk, an NGO, which does just that in a slightly more difficult setting. Um, but uh, I, I, for now, I'd rather stick to, to Berlin and mention the example of the city tax, which was an artist's initiative. Um, the group behind it was called Haben und Brauchen, uh, to have and to use. Um, and the, I, Berlin has had, before COVID, it had half a million tourists daily. Um, and 75% of them stated that art and culture was their main reason for being here. So this, uh, what artists proposed was to put a surcharge on all hotel rooms that were booked here, 5%, and to channel that money into the arts. The Senate actually picked up on this idea in 2013, um, but the ratification proceedings were quite cynical and brutal. And in the end, the arts wound up with much less than 5%. Um, what's a third of 2.5%? It was somewhere between, somewhere around 0.8%. Um, so in some ways it's, it was a disappointment. In other ways, it was uh, a sort of promising first step um, and actually, in all transparency, a good part of Realty itself was funded by, by the city tax initiative. And if I had more time, um, and maybe I'll do this during the discussion, I can go to residencies as an example, art residencies, international art residencies, as an example of a very strange um, cultural practice that is quite extractive and FIFO, fly in, fly out and which offers a great opportunity for a mass infrastructural retrofit uh, right now. Um, the key question here, if we uh, summon the, um, the, I'm coming to the, just to prove that you almost made it and I actually am at the end of my, my talk here. Um, I'll end share screen and just raise the, the question that a key, or, or to put, put it this way, a, a key question apart that of the, 
dealing with the complicity between contemporary art and gentrification is whether these working premises would work to a completely new genre of art altogether. Um, if we summoned the know-how and the protocols necessary for a broad take on redistributing contemporary arts resources anew, um, would this lead to uh, a completely different set of working premises uh, akin to what Suhail uh, likes to call post-contemporary art? Um, other terms that are floating around these days are speculative realism, post-humanist art, my own book Traction, which was mentioned in the intro, suggested realism as a, as a moniker. Um, the progressive contemporary art offshoots that I mentioned today tend to dismiss these ontological questions altogether. They just shrug at these uh, uh, discussions and God knows it's their right to do so. The problem is that we're then stuck with site-specific exceptions um, with Klein und Fein. And I'm not quite sure it's enough. I think that we do need a sense of strength in numbers. Uh, we need something maybe like the Bauhaus that achieved an experimentation, commodification, and institutionalization of their work in one fell swoop. Um, the benefits of a better art with a catchy name that could really rally and replicate, uh, the benefits are hard to deny. And I would argue that we should at least be curious enough to imagine such a thing mushrooming on a mass scale all over the place. Uh, weirder things have happened. So I'll end there. I think I'm, I think I'm pretty good with time. Okay. And um, I'll open it up to questions, complaints, compliments, concerns. Uh, and um, there you go. Thanks for thanks for for sticking it out. Thank Whoever's you. still out there. <laughs> thank you for <laughs> thank you for joining us this evening, Tia Adam, for presenting. Um, yeah, just to um, reiterate what you've just said. Obviously, yeah, if anyone has any questions, please either you know raise your hands and um, unmute yourself and ask them verbally, or if you have anything you want to pop into the chat, I'm happy to um, read that out to Tia Dad and the rest of the audience. While we're waiting on that, Tid, I just to say that um, actually during your talk, one of the, the um, attendees this evening, Leomi, had to leave um, because they are attending a meeting about their studio building, which is based in Nottingham, that is being purchased by the university and the 30 plus artists who have been there for over 10 years are having to find a new a new building so it kind of um yeah ties in obviously with the yeah. with a lot of what you said so um yeah they couldn't make the whole talk and we'll obviously catch from the the recording but I just wanted to express that obviously a lot of what you were speaking about was though not entirely focused on Berlin there was a focus around Berlin within your examples and obviously it's something that's very real in Nottingham especially for some of those who are who have attended this evening um Suhail was saying that there's a lot of concern about particularly universities being quite active in, in the sense in pretty problematic ways, if yeah. I understood correctly. Absolutely. I think that was something that certainly came about during the kind of Q&A as part of um, Suhail's um, discussion. So um, maybe something that gets picked upon um, within the questions here as well. Um, it has something from Alison um, who has said, are you talking about reformism and working within the capitalist system and overthrowing the system. Is this ultimately about system change and artists part in change? Um, okay, straight for the jugular. Uh, the big <laughs> no messing around. Um, I have to show my colors. Um, no, I mean, much as I, I have very old school, uh, hard left tendencies when it comes to my voting habits, or if I go out and collect signatures for something, etc. Uh, when I'm working as a curator, um, 
if if that was my sort of political horizon, I would leave contemporary art altogether. Um, I don't think that that radicality that she's pointing to is 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 an option. I think that reformism is what you, is the best you can hope for within contemporary art as as we presently know it. Um, this whole exercise that I've been pursuing is about um, taking the resources it brings to the table and retrofitting them, rechanneling them. Um, if you wanted a more radical proposition altogether, you would have to start. I mean, this is this is what I would argue based on my personal experience. You kind of would have to leave and start over. Um, I don't think the institution of contemporary art um, and its professionalization and the stakes involved would allow for something beyond reformism, beyond um, a redistribution um, within a, a, a free market uh, context. That's that's the most honest answer I can I can give. And maybe we'll lose our audience now because I'm a just another capitalist pig. I saw I saw. <laughs> <laughs> I saw a I saw a question in the chat which is about residencies. That's right. I just uh, just sorry. before that thought, Tid, just because um Hugh has his hand up, I didn't know if it related okay. to what cool. we were talking about before we move on to residencies. Hugh, is are you responding there to this conversation? Uh, it doesn't directly relate to this conversation, so we can jump onto residences first. No, no, that's fine, please. Um Okay, yeah, no, thank you. First, thank you so much. That was really fascinating. It's like really nice to come across like examples of work I like, but also like works that I didn't know as well. And lots of those kind of works seem to propose these, have this kind of, this kind of constructive sensibility where these in infrastructural conditions seem to be kind of integrated into the form of the artwork. Um, but my kind of question, I guess, is to what extent these kind of, these models these political models and these kind of attempts at redistribution are limited by their sort of um, their capacity to be scaled or their scalability. So like Maria Icon's work is a one-off. I can't, um, it still remains bound up with art world conditions of like authorship uh, and to an extent kind of property um, in very directly. So, and it represents still a kind of for me, as you said right at the end, you mentioned these kind of site-specific exceptions, I think. And so I was just wondering to what extent that's a kind of limit on, uh, that's a limit on the kind of these models and their scalability. Um, it's, thanks for that question. It's, it's a really, it's another really good, good question that puts the finger on a very sort of sensitive spot. Um, I mean, the, the, the Eichhorn's uh, artist contracts, it's not infrastructure, it's a more of a sort of, you know, it's paperwork. At least you can scale that across the art field. Um, the other more ambitious stuff, uh, I cannot answer the question because it hasn't, there isn't the sincere attention to attempt it. And so the first hurdle would be that. Um, the Statista uh, exercise included in that was this international summit of like-minded initiatives from all over the world. Um, interestingly, at the time, we actually flew them in. Nowadays, we'd Zoom. Um, and, the, 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 and I raised this exact question that you asked, and I said, all of us are sitting here. We, you know, some of you come from Lusanga, from St. Petersburg, from... Uh, East Asia, God knows where, and we all speak a similar language, we have similar concerns. Can we agree on some, you know, boilerplate blueprint thing where we can start to imagine scaling this stuff? And the answer was a flat out no. Uh, the, the only collective that thought otherwise um, were the, the, the sculptors from Lusanga, which were involved by what was it called? Certes, les travailleurs de plantation congolaise. I'm, I'm mentioning it wrong. It's, it's the project kickstarted by Renzo Martins. Um, and they were here, like two of the actual plantation workers, uh, Congolese sculptor plant, plantation workers, were in Berlin and they were saying, we're, we're fine with, with scaling. On the contrary, we want to replicate this thing. We need more hectares, hectares of land. We need, we need more people doing similar stuff. Everybody else was saying that. This is modernism. This is 
you know, this is the problem all over again. It's uh, trying to automate what actually needs to be local. Um, and I guess the experience of modernist expansionism was so violent that there's this real strong reaction against, against going there. Um, and I tend to think that actually um, you can do that kind of stuff differently. I've already spent a lot of time uh, answering this particular question, so I won't go into that, but I do think there are other ways of doing it. Um, but I won't know until we try. And right now there's an unwillingness to even give it a, give it a shot. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, um, okay, yeah, so let's move back on to Millie's question then around um, residences that you were about to comment on, Teodab, which uh, Millie's just said here, for anybody who hasn't seen the chat, you said you have more to suggest about the role of residences that could certainly be interesting to hear um, about, so. Yeah, very gladly. Um, so the, um, the, the, the basic idea behind it is that um, Art has engaged in these mass infrastructural retrofits many times in its, in its history. Um, and when it came to establishing residencies um, in, in Rome, uh, I think it was roughly two, two centuries ago when this kind of uh, tradition uh, began, um, it was a case of taking over monasteries, uh, nunneries, uh, hostels uh, for, uh, for, for, for uh, clerics. Um, and this was a kind of a retrofit. It's very, you know, that in itself is interesting in terms of what was, what was in, in political demand at the time and what was expected of, of, of art at this historical juncture. Um, but what, what I like to argue is that now, especially with the lessons learned from, from COVID, where hopefully we will have understood that this fly in, fly out international, uh, short term international residency model is, is you know, has, has its issues. But it would be time for another mass infrastructural retrofit. And I'm, I'm the artistic director of one such a, a residency in Bern. And what we've tried to do over the last few years, you know, because it's it, a, a residency just to contextualize it within the, con the conversation of today. If we're talking about gentrification, it's it's it really is a problem because it it teaches artists to um, uh, uh, to, to 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 zap as opposed to invest in 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 given um, uh, uh, problematics on the ground over a more protracted span of time. It uh, implants a sense of worldliness, which is actually uh, not uh, conducive to, uh, to the kind of political investment we're talking about here. And also it competes with, with rent, both the residency um, it's on site and in the hometowns of the artists who sublet their apartments when they leave for weeks or months or years at a time. Um, anyway, what we, what we tried to do in Bern was to, uh, a couple of years ago, we doubled the length of their stay we made artists come back again and again and again to the same location. Uh, we introduced more ambitious collective uh, working premises. Um, we halved the number of artists. Um, and now we've also limited the scope, the geographic radius from which artists can be flown in um, with the others being invited as, as digital residents. Um, and this, I think that with, with, with the pandemic though, it's, 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 it's quite likely that we'll be pushing towards even more ambitious timescales of not uh, months, but maybe years at a, at a time. Um, or Christopher Roth, who I mentioned earlier, um, with, with him, I conducted a, a, a workshop where um, we were trying to figure out how to pay artists to stay wherever the hell they are uh, at a given moment. Um, the workshop was called Don't Move. Um, and we were toying with ideas such as withdrawing people's passports, 
Um, and I'm highlighting this also to be smug and to mention that we were talking about this way before COVID, um, that we were ahead of the curve, et cetera. Um, but we were building on precedents that were actually quite, you know, that have been around. I mentioned further field in London, uh, which is, which is uh, ran, run by an artist called Ruth Catlow, who uh, wrote a manifesto called I Won't Fly for Art, I think 15 years ago. And she in turn was basing her writing on Gustav Metzger before her. Um, the Haben und Brauchen coalition that I mentioned with regards to city tax successfully introduced um, a production stipend in Berlin called the time stipend. So it's not, it's not uh, tied to, to, to place like, a, like a, a travel grant or a residency would be, but to time. It gives you uh, time to devote yourself without any pressures of production, uh, to devote yourself to your practice in Berlin on site, um, et cetera. These are, these are the, the working premises, premises that I've been uh, thinking along. And um, yeah, if the, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that over the coming um, months and years, there'll be completely new ideas as to how to tap into the idea of a residency without engaging in, in the fly in fly out uh, economy that it's become uh, connected to. Thank you. Has anyone um, got anything they'd like to add by way of another question um, relating to that topic or anything else around the discussion this evening? I think, um, Ted, I'd be interested to hear a little bit more around this idea of um, contemporary art anticipating its own future and um, kind of, yeah, why we're still given the benefit of the doubt around, around that, if you could expand. I have no idea why. I really don't. <laughs> I don't know what it is about. Um the 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 the, the magical uh, ability of of artists to 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 get in there and to engage in conversation time and again um by and large experts um uh, are are people who who move about and that's why people mistrust them um you know whether whether they are uh, investors or freelance scholars or creatives they're confronted with a very similar sense of skepticism with with good reason because when times are tough we're out of there or when the project is done we're out of there um and um but but artists for some for some reason um managed to get their foot in the door it might have something to do with the fact that as i was insinuating earlier um, they are these stylized versions of uh, the, the precarious middle classes at large, um, you know, with this flickering between being part of the problem um, and, and, uh, and a victim thereof. So this duck rabbit flickering, I think this might, this might uh, create a sense of complicity which opens doors. Um, I'm not sure, I'm, I'm, I'm speculating here. Um, and um, the the quote that I that I shared with you, I, I should have I should have mentioned mentioned her. Um, it's it's from Rosalind Deutsche, and she was she was talking about gentrification in the Lower East Side in the nineteen eighties. It's a it's a beautiful text. It's called the it's called the Art of Gentrification, I believe. Um, and so much of what is happening now, decades later, is already summarized beautifully within within that one uh, piece which she wrote for for October. Um, and what she was, what she was uh, trying to highlight is that um, there's, there's no sense in trying to claim a, a kind of critical virtue at this point. Um, art has moved from being dependent on um, sources of wealth, external sources of wealth, to becoming a generator of wealth in its own right. It now has a spot in the corridors of power. Um, and this is also reflected in, in the way artists approach the sites in which they work within. 
the discourse might still be one of a certain kind of, of modesty, of unknowing, undoing, um, indeterminacy, and so forth. But de facto, um, what, what happens is that, is that um, artists have a proactive um, sense of what, what a site is now and what it can be in the near future. Um, in the most, you know, opportunistic examples, um, it's, it's a sense of an artist in, investing in a given neighborhood, um, but it can also be something much more uh, subtle than that. It can be um, a case of an, of an artist, um, how to put this, uh, diffusing um, a sense of inevitability, you know, and a lot of social in socially engaged projects, you will see uh, not so much shouted demands, but a sense of melancholy, of inevitability, uh, you know, black and white pictures of neighborhood memories, uh, personal souvenirs, showcases, uh, very melancholic slogans painted together with, with kids. Uh, like there's a sense of loss, which is almost naturalized. Um, and this is, this is a, in, in, in the worst cases, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, and and, and um, my argument was that uh, if this is happening regardless, then maybe if we, if we use terms such as propaganda, then that would force us into, into another kind of, of position, another kind of uh, claim to the sites that we work with. That's um, really helpful, thank you. Thanks for expanding on that point, um, to that. Um, I think it's interesting as well, you know, thinking about some of the organizations that, you know, um, that I work for or some others might work for or are involved in that kind of, like you say, that self-fulfilling prophecy and the way in which um, socially engaged practice and work with communities and neighborhoods is uh, presented through projects and exhibitions. Um, has anyone else in the room got another question that they'd like to ask Teardad, please? Uh, Hugh, go for it. Hello, you, hi, we're relying on you here. Sorry to jump in again. I, I, want to ask, <laughs> I want to ask a very sort of probably a very obvious question or very obvious query. So, uh, but but I suppose when when most people kind of commonly think of art, uh, they think of artworks that exist within an exhibition system, and those works might be kind of quite complex or nuanced or difficult or indeterminate um, and might also include uh, including the kind of institutional and political and economic conditions that come to in which they're shown which come to come to constitute them and I guess I kind of want to ask within because I've, I've I've I find the kind of the, your presentation very is like very very powerful I kind of guess I want to ask what kind of place there is within this theorization for like a different kind of value, which might be not a financial value, but a kind of critical value, I suppose, a kind of a value, the kind of critical where artworks can kind of resist, uh, like critically resist, I suppose, um, and have some kind of level of autonomy, I guess, um, and aren't just necessarily overwhelmed or just straightforward straightforwardly kind of complicit with these uh, uh, they're not only complicit with these processes of like gentrification um yeah thanks for that question i mean you so you mean you mean artworks that are sort of maybe institutional critique for example or artists that uh, are a form of testimony which which point to particular like th these kinds of critical engagements is that yeah 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 um well uh, one one answer that 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 comes to mind is that uh they they, they do have uh enormous um or let's put it this way the, the the proof that they have traction lies in the fact that they're very often censored actually 
um, there's this pervasive sense that institutional critique is everywhere and institutions critique themselves and critique is too easy and et cetera. This is complete. I mean, in, in my experience, it's bullshit. Um, there's for every example of, of really uh, institutionally critical um, work that's out there, there are 20 which were watered down or censored outright. Um, and I don't just mean, you know, the Middle East where I've also worked, I mean, Europe, uh, German institutions, UK institutions, it's, uh, it's not done, it's not done with, you know, angry threats, it's done over a cup of coffee, uh, it's regretted, you know, <laughs> uh, for reasons of weather, of admin, of permits, finances, unfortunately, your projects cannot be shown in this or that way. Um, when it comes to gentrification, the, 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 the sort of legendary example is that Sapolsky project by Hans Hake, um, which was censored by the Guggenheim and the curator's career was sacrificed. Edward Fry, the patron martyr of all curators, he never worked again. Uh, it's, it's this... <laughs> classic tale of, of censorship and the Guggenheim has since apologized. Um, all, all of which is to say that um, it's, it obviously has traction, otherwise it wouldn't be policed so carefully. Um, I think that the, 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 how to put it, the, the potential of contemporary art, however, it's um, to, to make um, a difference beyond its field, the field itself lies elsewhere. Um, I think that you can do a lot within the field if you touch on the wrong sort of nerves and you can shake things up and you can realign things and maybe even redistribute things. But as a field and with regards to its relationship to, to the outside, I don't think um, critique is what will really make waves. Um, I think it's, it's a critique can only be one step in a much longer process. Um, critique is necessary to understand the directions in which a, you know, a realignment can happen, but um, what I've been calling the propagandistic moment, the propos propositional moment, um, if that's missing, yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I mean, even in the, like my, my colleagues in, in, in Tehran would say, well, I'm not sure if that's true. You're talking about, um, you know, a West democratic sort of liberal society type of model. Um, critique and censorship is a whole other ball game here. And there are many places such as Tehran where contemporary art is actually very active. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm not saying, you know, never and, and always, there's no such thing. Um, but if we, if we zoom out and we look at contemporary art as a field and we try to understand where the leverage is by and large, I don't think it's with critique. Thank you. Thank you for your question, Hugh, and for your response to your dad. Um, has anyone got anything else they'd like to ask before we begin to, I guess, wrap things up? Um, got nothing else in the chat at the moment. So if anyone else has any um, kind of final thoughts or a question they'd like to pose before I drop a link to the audience survey into the chat. <laughs> No. Okay. Well, let people enjoy the let people go enjoy the the weather. Yeah, it is. Yeah, last, yeah. last little bit of sun, I guess, for the evening. Um, <laughs> so thank you everyone for spending some of your evening with us. Um, thank you, Tia Dad, so much for your um, yeah extremely insightful and thorough talk um, and for responses to questions there. Um, thank you for being part of the New Midland Group Development Programme. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we've currently got some open call opportunities for artists based within the Midlands. So I've just dropped a link there to the website. Um, you can sign up to our newsletter at the bottom of the page as well, and you can find out information about upcoming public programme events. Um, so further talks, discussions, 
workshops, all free to attend. And as promised, here is a link, hopefully, to which will take you to a downloaded version of the audience survey. Um, please fill it out in your own time if you get the opportunity to do so. Um, but thank you again, Tiedab, for your time this evening. I know you're an hour ahead over there as well, so it's getting a little bit late <laughs> if I want to grab some dinner. So um, thank you, everyone. Thanks, Colette, and thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you. This Bye, was everyone. great. Bye-bye. Thanks for the questions, too. Thank you. Bye.